I should have brought my sunglasses. My, my, my. Then you would have think I was some sort of cool Hollywood preacher, but anyway. Good, good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Would you like to know why I decided to get into full-time preaching? I hope you do, because I'm prepared to tell you. <laughs> I don't take no for an answer very well. You won't believe this, but you will have to, because you know why would I make it up and lie to you about it. It's the truth, absolute truth. The reason I, in 1978, decided to leave a very good-paying job in uh, Cortland, Alabama, it was in a paper mill. Champion was the name of it, Champion Paper Mill. I decided to leave that. No, they didn't fire me. I decided to leave that job and to go into the work of being a full-time gospel preacher. And the reason? I wanted to make a difference. I'm not stretching that to make a good connection with a sermon title. I hadn't thought about that, and I don't know how long. I don't know if Tammy's heard it before. She's my sister for you that don't know. It's not because it's been a secret. I just haven't talked about it very much. I haven't maybe had occasion to talk about it very much. Not too many times have I been asked, why are you a preacher? But it's the absolute 100% truth. Jared's probably hearing it. That's my son. He's probably hearing it for the first time. In the summer, I think it was probably mid-late summer of 78, uh, I decided to try to make more of a difference with my life than what I was doing. Now quickly, let me say for you that work at paper mills, nothing wrong with working at paper mills, and boy did they pay good. I was in my early 20s, I was making a lot of money. So it had nothing to do with that. I've actually told people later, I'm glad that it was that way. I never had to wonder, did you get into preaching because you couldn't do anything else to make a living? <laughs> no, I actually left quite a good living to get into preaching and made much less. I did it because I wanted to make a difference. Not that arrogantly I am indispensable to Christ and he needs me and I've got to show the world what I could make a difference for or about. No, no, no. It came from a very humble place. I just felt like I wanted to do more than what I was doing to make a difference in the world, to leave some kind of, not legacy, but some kind of results of my having lived here. That's the end of the sermon. No, <laughs> but I'm just trying to show you that it makes a difference. You making a difference. Anyway, you can make a difference, though, in all kinds of ways other than just being a preacher in case you're thinking you're trying to get all of us guys to get into full-time preaching. No, not at all. And for ladies alike, there are a number of good ways that you can make a difference as a Christian other than being a pulpit pit preacher. You could be like Dorcas who loved to make clothes for people. Don't say she didn't, though, make a difference. Oh, you know the story better than that. Or you could be Andrew who brought his brother to meet Jesus. You know who Andrew's brother was, right? If not, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Figure it out on your own. But in this little speech, and when I'm through, you'll say, that wasn't little. This short little speech that I've got prepared for you here, I want you to do a lot more thinking about whatever it is that you're doing, assuming it's good, and it's making a difference. Far more than you may realize, you're making a difference. And I'm going to show you as we go along, God may actually be more so interested in the thing you're doing that you may be entertaining as not making a difference. That's exactly what he wants. That's exactly who he wants, and I'll save that for then. Thanks for inviting me. I thanked Craig for his kind words, but I want to thank everybody. I don't know who was behind the invitation. May have only been Craig. May have been Tammy whispering in his ear. But anyway, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be home. I have homes all over the world, but this is one of them. Some of my greatest times of life have been spent here. That's not to say there's no other places I enjoyed living less or more. I'm just saying I loved my three years here among you here. Coming back to talk to friends is like coming back home again. So glad to be back, to be the building. Is, you've made a lot of changes, but the, Tammy said as we walked in, this probably looks just the same to you, doesn't it? And it does. It still looks the same. It's great to be back home. Thanks for having me. It's always nice to be had. Two people thought that was funny. Anyway, most people didn't even get it. Okay, get serious. 
the title that was assigned me, and like I said, I don't know if it was Craig or, or who that came up with the titles. The, the, the title assigned me was Passionate About Making a Difference. And I want to talk about all three sections of that. I want to talk about passion. I want to talk about making a difference. And then one that's not in the title, Craig's alluded to it because he knew what I think I was going to specifically try to emphasize. I want to take this principle of passionately making a difference and apply it to sharing our faith. And the lesson will be yours. I hope you will be exhorted to passionately make a difference in sharing your faith with others. But let's talk about passion first. What do you mean? It's easily said. It's a word that is uh, uh, used often enough that I think we're familiar, but maybe we haven't paused to ask a little bit by way of definition. I'm going to change it. I'm going to say it's enthusiasm. Now, you may have a better word that you would like to use instead, but that's the one I'm going with. We need to enthusiastically find ourselves or enthusiastically apply ourselves to anything our hands find to do. Anything that we are minding as our business to tend to, we need to make it a difference maker because we bring enthusiasm to it. And why? Because you're assigned to talk about that tonight. No, no, not at all. It's because, and pardon the bluntness and just right to the, to the best answer I can think of, God says so. That's the best answer. There are others, but that's the best one. Let's start with the best, and we'll work from there. Why do I need to be passionate about anything the Lord would have me do? Because he said so. And if he says so, then I need to dismiss any of my I don't want to about it. Ecclesiastes 9, whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might. See, I wish that Bible verse was not in there, but it's too late. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily. For or as for the Lord and not for men. Passionate enthusiasm reveals what's in our heart that we care about. I need to repeat that for my sake as much as yours. Passionate enthusiasm reveals what's in our heart about what we care much about. I, I, I know you're thinking because you're thinking, is that true? It is, I think. What you care a lot about will be reflected in or show itself in the amount of energy you put into it, the amount of enthusiasm, the amount of passion, and the such like. I'll just give you an example of how I don't have much passionate about something. For instance, I don't have much passion about cooking. I just don't. I mean, I'll cook some eggs if you want me to, and I don't hate doing it, but I don't have any enthusiasm about it. <laughs> I don't have any passion about it. And it's not like, what do we say? It's like pulling teeth. You know, it's not hard to get me to do it, but I don't have any enthusiasm. On the other hand, hopefully the NFL season will start soon and the Packers are going to the Super Bowl, except for you Cowboy fans. We are going, and I am enthusiastic. They call me a fanatic. I am enthused. I am passionate. Go, Pack, go, because I care more about that. Hopefully not more than anything, but I'm saying way more than cooking. I care about football. So whether it be your job, your hobby, your recreation, get this next one, your politics, hmm? your social causes, your family, your church, whatever it is, bring enthusiasm into it. Mix a healthy cup of, more than a cup actually, a gallon of enthusiasm into it. Please bring it into those things. Pray to God for a passionate heart for serving him in whatever you do. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Let me be negative just for a minute, and then I'll move on to a discussion about making a difference. For now, it's still passion as the introductory comments. Let me go negative, though, just for a second. Half-heartedly doing anything is ungodly. Slap dash work is ungodlike. And some of you are sitting there saying, I'm not sure about that. So I got to repeat it, do I? Half-heartedly doing anything or something is ungodlike, doing slap dash work ungodly. Vince Lombardi, I know you know I can't get off the Packer. Vince Lombardi once said, if you aren't fired with enthusiasm, you'll be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> Amen, Mr. Lombardi. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about making a difference for a little bit, okay? Let's talk about that just for a few minutes. I wish especially uh, to urge all of us who are somehow selling ourselves short on making a difference to not do that, meaning my next few minutes, I want to try to get you to rethink that, admonish you, exhort you, please don't sell yourself short. The, 
in thinking that I don't make a difference in whatever it is that you're doing. Don't minimize the difference that you're making because it doesn't compare to how him or her does something similar. Jesus one time said, it's a lot like members of your physical body, so it is the church or spiritual body. Members that seem to be, that's my emphasis, seem to be less needful, seem to be less honorable, or whatever you want to call great, God has a purpose for that one in the body, and nobody's amening it. And so I have to give you scripture, I guess, those members of the body which seem to be worker, weaker are necessary. That's an exact quote. Argue with God if you don't like it. That's what he says, 1 Corinthians 12, 22. Those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, not just tolerated, not just don't have to dismiss them from the fellowship. They are necessary. Say it again. They are necessary. How in the world then could we turn around thinking that I'm a weaker member and somehow don't make a difference and it's not, you know, how can you say that? This is what is necessary. I'm just borrowing Holy Spirit language. We are to see, if, if anybody has a problem with it, it's me not seeing what God sees. And that is that they are necessary. God says, you need to think like I think. You think of yourself as being inconsequential. It's not going to make any difference. The little bit that I do, what difference does it make? God says differently than you think. Talk about making a difference. God says, I differently make a difference. <laughs> and it's a big difference, whatever God says about it. All right, that's, a, believe it or not, an introduction. Uh, let's talk about the principle of how it, how it applies to sharing our faith, okay? When it comes to sharing your faith, you make a difference. First of all, let me start this way. Just how, mo how important do you think sharing your faith is? One nod, two nods, and a little bit of this. Well, let me rephrase it. How important is it confessing your faith before men? Oh, a lot, but see, now that gets a lot more, yeah, 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 that's, now we're talking. They basically are the same thing. I didn't say exactly, but in the same ballpark. Sharing, confessing your faith before men and sharing your faith to whomever you encounter basically comes from the same place. It's just slightly worded or looking at it differently. Well, how, how important is this business of confessing my faith? <laughs> it's mandatory if you want to get past judgment. <laughs> That's how much it's important. For the Lord says, you know how it goes. Confess me before men. I confess you before God. You don't confess me, or he puts it differently. He says, deny me, and that's just another way of saying you don't confess me. I won't confess you. You want me to say, I know Whit. I, I, I know Craig. I know Tammy. Well, then you've got to start confessing me before men, but I don't care to do that. You better start caring about that unless you want to go to the bad place. You better get going. This is going to be needful. I'm telling you, I have the, I'm the saving one here, not you. You're the being saved. I'm the saving one, and I can make whatever I wish to be as requirements of being successfully beyond the judgment. And here's one, and it's not the only one, but here's one. I will acknowledge people who acknowledge me before people, before men, confess me before men. So if I were you, I'd get used to it in a hurry, like it or not. Thank you. Like it or not. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. It's what Father said. Father said, start confessing before men. Now, we can get all wrapped up in methods and approaches and uh, personal work seminars. And I'm not poo-pooing those things, thinking, waste of time. No, I'm just saying we can get all wrapped up in that, and we forget that really it's not just the, it's not so much at all the method, assuming it's scriptural. <laughs> I like to use an example. I like to be absurd to make a point when I said, assuming it's scriptural, you don't need to pay people. <laughs> I don't think that's scriptural. Give you 20 bucks if you're baptized. No, I wouldn't do that if I were you. But beyond that, now that we're back to this, there needs to be not so much the concern about the method as there is the one working the method, which is whomever, right? Do you follow me? It isn't so much the method, it's the person going into the world seven days a week and living his life as a Christian, sharing his faith any way you want, but sharing it, pass it on. Freely having received, you finish it. 
freely give. And everything I've received, you know where I'm headed? Some of you are, you could preach the sermon better than me. You know where I'm headed with this, don't you? And that is every single one of us, I know you're the exception, but everyone is in here basically a Christian because somebody shared their faith with you. Don't raise your hand if you're the exception, but I imagine you are super rare and exception. Nobody had any influence on me being a Christian. It was totally me on a desert island with a Bible. That was all it was. Okay, I can use you for a good illustration. <laughs> but most, 99 and 9 tenths of us, had a parent or parents or friend, or boyfriend, or girlfriend, or husband, or wife, or neighbor, or preacher, or elder, or somebody. I even heard one tonight about just somebody at a restaurant. I mean, it could be just anybody, basically. Having had a part to play in you being a Christian, it's time to pay forward. It's time for you having freely received, now to freely give. You are a Christian and have a good hope of eternal life because somebody shared their faith with you. Now it's your turn. Tammy was mentioning as we were coming in the building that there hadn't been a whole lot of development or not development, what's the word, refurbishing, whatever the word, to the building since 1970 and so forth, way before I even was living here. And it was time, that, you know, a lot was done then that was enjoyed for many, many years. Now it needs to be more done for many more years to come, you know, that kind of thing. You know where I'm headed with this one, right? 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 You're sitting here because somebody shared their faith and got you to where you are now. Now, come on. Start sharing it so somebody else can say the same of you 30 years from now. Do it. Do it. You owe it to yourself. Wrong. You owe it to God. Okay. You owe it to the world. Whatever, whomever, get going. Get going. I'm not a strong advocate of cold contact sharing, meaning just abruptly going up to a door, I'd like to talk to you about God or church or heaven or soul or whatever. It's okay. I've done some of that kind of thing. I don't mean to say it's bad. I'm just not a great advocate or fan of it. Neither am I much of a fan just standing out in the open and talking and hoping somebody will stop to listen to what I've got saying, I'm saying on my, on my soapbox. By the way, I literally saw that with my own eyes. You ever heard about somebody on their soapbox? I literally saw a guy preaching on a soapbox one time in London, England, Hyde Park. He was on a, I think it was a soapbox. It was a wood crate box of some kind. Usually we just talk that way and we've never seen it. I actually saw it with my own eyes and stood and listened to him preach for a little bit. My point is this. You want to do it that way? Go ahead. Until the police stop you, you go right ahead and do that. I'm not saying, though, that that's what I am encouraging you to do. That's not what I'm saying at all. But these days, find some way to what you think effectively will do a good turn sharing your faith with somebody else. And I'm not going to give you all kinds of examples. I have 60, by the way, and I'm not exaggerating to make a point. 60. It may be more than 60 now. I've added to it probably. I wouldn't be surprised when I go back and pull it from my file and there's 64. But I have 60 ways to reach the lost. And almost all of them, there are exceptions, Almost all of them are individually done, not church paid for and supported. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying that's not what it's made up. It's made up a list. Thanks, Andrew. It's made up a list of 60 ways you can use. And some of them are costly. Some of them are pretty pennies. But be honest, you guys, some of you have pretty pennies a lot. And you could do it. Yeah. Hey, is that going to be $500? I could do that. But there's a lot of them on there don't cost a penny, literally. It just means you want to go try that effort that, that way of doing it. And if you want that list, I'll dig it out of my file somewhere and send you it electronically or however you want it. Next thing I want to say about this is praying. I should have said it first, but you'll, it's just in my notes in this order. We don't need to leave God out of the sharing the faith ex efforts or exercises that we employ and do. Make sure you pray for opportunities to share the faith. Why? Because it's nice to say, thank you, Lord. True, but I believe in providence. I do believe there is a great deal of behind-the-scenes influences, we sometimes call it blessings or providence, influences on people and places lining up in a favorable way. One guy says that's amen. Anybody else? That's, I believe, true. Whenever Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch crossed paths, it was not happenstance, I don't think. Whenever people are in a place we sometimes say, well, that's my lucky day. I was in the right place at the right time to hear that. I imagine it was not just a lucky thing, but it may have been God's finger of blessing, perhaps, if you want to use that word. 
So my point is this. Pray to God that his providence be useful today in me. How do we sing it? Lead, to, lead me to some soul today. Do that. Do that. Pray that he be using your efforts, whatever they might, they might be, to reach. You can't sit at home and lock yourself in the closet and wonder why you're not reaching the lost. I know why. You're not open. You're not open. <laughs> you're not out there. But pray to God and then get out there and make yourself available and watchful in prayer. It's not my specific technique or a terrific plan, but it's God who gives the increase. Paul put himself down, I think, a little bit extravagantly, meaning I think it was a little bit much the way he said it, but I cannot deny he strongly, with the Holy Spirit inspiration, felt it. I am nothing. Come on. You're the greatest, you're the greatest evangelist that ever lived. I am nothing. I'll go ahead and speak for Apollos. I hope he's okay with me saying this. He ain't anything either. But God is everything. And you might say, well, what's that have to do with anything? Exactly what we're talking about. He's talking about preaching the gospel, planting the gospel church, watering the gospel church. And he says, eh, we're nothing. God's providence is everything. So don't, in, don't forget to include him in all of this. All right. Man, I can't even see the clock, so I'm excused if I go over. I say, it's seven. Okay. All right. <sighs> I want to talk for a few minutes about making a difference in sharing our faith. I've discussed it a bit, but not as much as you're about to hear. <laughs> now we're going to really get stuck in. We can feel unimportant. I want to talk first of all about us seeing ourselves as feeling, uh, not making a difference, and how we ought not to be that way. Okay, here's, here, I'm seeing in my notes a thought here to get me going with this. What I need to do is address those who, for whatever reason, think that way. Where's that coming from? And I'm not trying to be an amateur psychologist here. Where's that coming from? Where are you somehow coming from in your mind, psychologically thinking, you don't make a difference? Got to think about it, don't you? I do too. So let me just take a stab at it, and that's all I'm doing. Let me just scrape at it and see if we can get a thought or two that might be helpful. We can feel unimportant. We can feel inadequate because we're comparing ourselves to others. One nod. We are thinking compared, I'll use me, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying I'm, I'm up here, so I'll use me. Not as good as you are, Whit. That may or may not be true. But because you think it's true, whether it is or isn't, you think you don't make a difference like you. Whit, you've been fully preaching for what, 40, 50 years? You go all over the place. You're great. What little bit I do, is that going to make any difference? I think that's maybe where some of that's coming from. We're comparing ourselves amongst ourselves with others. Man, and Craig will agree, can gospel preachers usually always think of someone they don't stack up compared to? It's almost, I just did it a minute ago with the Apostle Paul. He's the greatest preacher that ever lived. And he said, I'm nothing. It's God who's everything. Well, that doesn't leave me a leg to stand on anywhere. I'm not going to amount to much. Compared to Paul, here we go. Compared to Paul, I'm not going to make a difference. See, that's where I think it's coming from, and I'm not trying to sound like an expert with the way my, the mind works here, but maybe that's where it's coming from. Whatever reason, though, it is that causes you to think that you don't make a difference, that you won't be missed, that the work will go on just as well without you, think again. Please, think again about that twice. Think again. That's not true. You do make a difference in all aspects of the service of the kingdom, and I don't just mean sharing faith though that's the one I'm emphasizing. Sowing of the seed of the kingdom, sharing your faith, or whatever you wish to call it in this lecture, how untrue is it that you don't make a difference? That is just not true. You're talking to yourself in a way that the Lord would not approve. Okay, let's switch it. The devil's putting ideas in your head. That's not the Lord talking. You might say, well, I, how do you know if it's the Lord's talk or not? Or how do you know it's the devil? Well, here I know the Lord talks how he talks, and see if you don't think so. Let me show you the biblical principle. The first one is, do not despise small things. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, quote, Whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. The context is that the people of the day were having a sour attitude about the rebuilt temple when comparing it to the majestic one that Solomon had built, which had been destroyed. God did not care for that thought, that attitude. Oh, it's great, I guess, but nothing like stacked up to what Solomon built. 
Who is it that's daring to despise the day of small things? Now, see, that's not the devil talking. That's God talking. That's how he talks. How dare you put it down and despise it just because it's not as big as what I had built with Solomon? Oh, my. See if you recognize this quote. Only those who dare mighty deeds are truly alive. Colonel George Custer. And you know where it got him. <laughs> yeah. No, I like Ralph Waldo Emerson better. He said, he that despises small things will perish little by little. Amen to that. And he's not an inspired writer, but I, I, don't, like, <laughs> I don't like George Custer's statement. Unless you do big things, you're not really living. Yeah, and you're dead too. Ralph, I know, is dead also, but I like his attitude more. I tell you, if you take this approach of thinking little things don't amount to much, you're just going to perish little by little. I'll go with the latter. How about you? So we need to adopt the mentality of being a ball holder in a football game. I told you I can't get away from football. I love that. You who don't know football, where have you been? No, anyway. <laughs> They hold the football, right? Hold the football with their finger, I guess, a hand there, and the guy kicks a 55-yard field goal, and he gets all the praises, and they throw him up in the air, and they hug him, and poor little ball holders just over there, I guess nobody paying any attention. I tell you what, if he doesn't grab it and put it down and hold it and turn it and all that kind of thing, he's not celebrating. We, I'm going to get choked up about this, we all need to be ball holders in the kingdom of God. I don't have to get everybody, you know, rah, rah, rah about me, but I know I'm playing a part, and it may just be holding the ball for somebody else to kick it. Amen? Man often views little things with contempt, or at least having a diminished importance. But remember that God doesn't think like we do, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. He challenges us over and over, if you will. Who dares despise the day? Of small thing. Oh, not me. I don't want to do it anymore. Well, then stop saying that you don't make a difference then. Because that's what you're doing. You're thinking, well, I don't make a difference. The little thing I do doesn't make any difference. Who dares to despise the little things you do? Me. Oh, my. Cut that out. Now, I'm going to step on, step not step on your toes, but step out there in faith a little bit here next. But I hope I don't step out on a limb that breaks off with me on it. God may actually prefer small things to get his work done. You know why, don't you? So he gets all the credit. And you might say, well, egotistical maniac. No, 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 no. Don't go there. Don't go there. No, don't go there. He has to be the source of all good. And us, we, are the ones that need to get on board with the thinking that he gets all the credit. I'm nothing. Apollos is nothing. He's everything. That's the way I have to be about everything. And if doing the little things is my contributing part, I guess just get to hold the ball for somebody to kick it, and God gets all the glory, yes, exactly the way it should be. Great. God gets all the credit. I don't want any of it. When they start patting me on the back and saying, oh, you're really a great preacher. I don't know. I, uh, I feel a little uncomfortable with that. <laughs> not saying I never say thank you, but I'm just saying. This is not in my notes. Over in eastern Nigeria, my dad and I back in the, 80s, I think it was, 1982, I believe, uh, we would often hear people respond. It wasn't in Western, we were in Western Nigeria too. It wasn't as much in the West. In the Eastern region, in the tribal areas of Eastern Nigeria, you would, they would want to show you appreciation. They didn't have much money, but they wanted, wanted to show appreciation for you and, and, uh, and your dad or my dad and me going to preach from America. I was living in England at the time, but anyway, we met and, and we went there for about seven weeks or so, and they'd give you whatever they had. They'd give you a, st a stalk of bananas, they'd give you a couple dozen eggs, they'd give you whatever, some oranges, you know, that kind of thing. What do you say? You say, thank you. They're over and over and over and over. I don't know how many times we heard in response to our thanking them, oh, don't thank me, thank God. It was a pat response over and over and over and over again. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my mama taught me right. Thank you. Appreciate the bananas. Thank you very much. Oh, don't thank me. Thank God. Thank you for the eggs. Oh, don't, don't, don't thank me. Thank God. You think I went out and laid them? No. <laughs> that was me adding that part. They didn't. <laughs> but joking aside, exactly, exactly. Where egg, exactly. Where did I get the eggs? You think I grew them? 
Well, you raised the chickens. Yeah, which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know? <laughs> Don't thank me. Thank God will work for almost everything. Everything. I got off track there. Let me give you some Old Testament example. Naaman, you know the story, right? The uh, Syrian captain or, or military man leader that had leprosy. You can read about it in 2 Kings chapter 5. Give you a couple points. It was a young, young servant girl of his wife that directed him to the prophet for healing. Later on, it was a servant who came out to instruct him what to do. And then it was a small act, physically that is, dunking in water, the Jordan. And finally, Naaman's servants helping their master to get to, to, get to seeing things straight. Here's another one, Gideon. And the 300 men story, you can read about it in Judges 7. God deliberately, deliberately, on purpose, meaning to do what he did, he said, too many people, too many people. You don't need that many people. You guys are going to think you were militarily ad, 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 victorious because you had so many guys, you, you outnumbered them or whatever. 32,000, too many. So it's reduced to 10,000, still too many. 300. Okay, we'll go with that. Because when you win this victory, there's no way you can say we did it. And that's what you want. You, have I lost you already? I've talked and rambled so long, I've lost you. I'm trying to show you God prefers little things. The little things that you think don't make a difference. You, you are probably just who he wants. Rather than you selling yourself short and quitting because what little, what, what I do, what little is it, doesn't make much of a difference. Everybody knows David and Goliath, the young man in a sling. 3,000 years later, we still talk about David and Goliath as an underdog beating a superior opponent. Even in football, we hear about it. Christ taught the principle in a number of places. The mustard seed an analogy, Mark 4, he said, what can we compare the kingdom of God to? What parable can we use for it? I can almost see him scratching his head. I don't think Christ ever had to think two, two seconds about it, but I can just he's asking it as if he's trying to figure out, hmm, how can, I, how can I illustrate that? Uh, it's like a mustard seed, which is so small you can hardly see it. But that's what I want you to see the kingdom is like. The little, littlest thing you can imagine. That's it. And boy, can it have a big result. Yeah, amen. Luke 10, 21. In that same hour, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And he says, oh, thank you. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the big boys and just revealed it to little kids. And he didn't mean little in the sense of physical. What he meant was people that aren't too full of themselves and think they're such big stuff. Thank you. I'll read it exactly as it's written here in, in my notes. Thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father. Well, that was your gracious will. That is what you always wanted. That's what you intended. That her or him who thinks they little make a contribution to the kingdom and what I do won't really make a difference. Thank you for revealing and going through them and not through the others. There's a, there's a scripture elsewhere that says, not many mighty are called, thankfully, for otherwise I'd be left out. In Luke 9, 46, an argument arose among them as to who's, who, which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child, put him in his, or by his side, said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. How many more verses do you need to show you that God prefers what you're selling yourself short as making any difference about he wants you. And I don't mean he'll tolerate and put up with you. You are necessary because it's his gracious will that he wishes preferably to use you. He didn't say nobody mighty is called, but did you notice not many do? Not many mighty are called. Oh, yeah, there's one or two or three. Most, For the most part, it's not those type. And everybody's familiar, right, with the widow's might? Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts into the offering box. He saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than them all. But well, they all contribute out of their abundance. She, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. 
two cents. It just rattles in the plate. Come on. Do the treasurers really need to count that? I'd count it if I were you. Where I am in Appleton, I do think about it occasionally, but not much. It's not because we don't have good counters or trusty counters. Or I just I want to make sure. In fact, I'm not exaggerating. It happened this last week. I think the week before this, I found a penny on the floor, and I went and put it in the plate. And it's not because I'm so honest I don't know how to behave. It's a matter of that needs to be given to the Lord. It's only a penny. And so was this widow woman's, just a little bit. So there you have it. Oh, I'm not done. I'm not done because some of you are slow to pick up on this. Matthew 10, 42, whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he's going to heaven. Well, that's not exactly how it reads, but it indicates he will by no means lose his reward. Well, like I said, he's going to heaven. That's all? Well, he didn't say that's all, but I'm telling you, you can start with that. Well, that's all I can do. All I can do is give a cup of cold water to a kid. That's all I can do. It doesn't make a difference. Oh, does it make a difference going to heaven or not? Oh, yeah, it makes a difference. He says, I'm telling you, you're not losing your reward if that's all you can do and if you do it. Don't sell yourself out thinking, I might as well not do it. It's not going to make a difference anyway. And then I love this last one. Maybe it's just me and I can say it's just me. You remember that, that parable of the, of the soils and the sower and all of that? Remember that? Some fell on thorny ground and the rocky ground. Okay, you, do you remember the good ground? Yes, I hope you do. <laughs> Some fell on good ground and produced how much? Some 30 some 60, some 100. I'm very weak in math, but I think 30 is a far cry from 100. <laughs> he didn't say some produced 95, some 97, and some 100. He said some 30. Shoot, that's less than half, I think. And it's all good soil producing good fruit, right? Right. And just so it is in sharing our faith, we may, not approve, we may not appraise, rather, our worth as much, but God loves to choose such as this to accomplish his business so that the power is seen as his and not man's. Little OU may not only make a difference, it may be that little OU is just what the Lord wants. <sighs> How's that for making a difference? My, my, my. Sometimes when I was a kid, Tammy can relate to this, you know, sometimes it was more mental ag agonizing. Jared, you can relate to this because I was my dad to him. Uh, agonizing, what will, God, what will dad say when he gets home? How will he view what you are supposedly in trouble for? My son Jameson, I remember we lived in New Hampshire at the time. And I don't remember what it was, but he was in trouble for something. And I had to say, because we're driving, probably I said, son, when we get home, we're going we're gonna to deal with this. And boy, was he, ever, <laughs> was he ever crying so much on the way home. I haven't even done anything yet. But it's the fear of what is it going to be. Now, you might say, where are you headed with that? I'm glad you asked. We know where God is going to be with regard to this. And we may be thinking, God's not going to make, he doesn't care whether I do anything. What, make, what doesn't make a difference? A little bit that I do is what contribution really is it to the kingdom and so forth. Now, after reading and studying these scriptures that we have, please, you don't need to be regretting, or not regretting, wrong word, uh, uh, fearful of how he's going to view this. He's already revealed himself. He's already told you, you will be rewarded. So you don't need to sell yourself short. Maybe that wasn't a good illustration. Five more minutes maybe, Craig? Okay. He said I could. There's room for you in the kingdom. There's a song we sing like that, right? There is room in the kingdom of God, my brother, for the big things that you can. That ain't how it reads. It isn't how it sings. You're making it up. It doesn't say that. For you that haven't sung that old song, <laughs> it says the small things that you can do. There's room in the kingdom for the small things that you can do. Stop singing the song if you don't believe that. But compared to you, Whit, I'm small and insignificant. I could debate small with you, but I'll pass just because I want to emphasize the second part. Insignificant, forget debating. I'll just take issue with you and tackle it and say you're wrong. You're wrong. 
I'm, I'm just, now you can say, well, you're wrong. Okay, fine. But, but I'm just telling you what you, you've asked me compared to you, or you used me as an example. You said compared to you, Whit, I, I just don't amount to much. I'm small. I don't amount to much. I don't think you are, but I'll pass on the small part and say, yes, you do amount because I know what the scriptures say, and I've shared them with you. You do. You do amount to so much, and don't count yourself out. Don't say I'm insignificant. Sure, you're not indispensable. I don't want to make it like the Lord can't operate without you, but that's on the other extreme. You're selling yourself out as I don't bring anything really to the table worth contributing. That's not true. That's not right. Let me tackle here at the close a few things that I think will be helpful, especially in connection with sharing your faith and you making a difference. All right, I've got about three or four and I'll be through. Number one, you make a difference because no one can get around to everyone. Thank you. Two, I'm looking for four nods. No, anyway, that's two or three I'll take. You, we, we, we cannot get around. We can't be everywhere all the time to everyone. You make a difference because no one can get around to everyone, and time is swiftly passing so that you could be very instrumental in helping to reach even if it's just one more soul. It would make it worth the whole world for them to have been reached before it was too late. While there's still time, while there's still hope, we've got to make hay while the sun shines, or as Jesus would say it differently, work, work, night's coming, no man can work anymore, it's getting night, work. We just switch it and say, make hay while the sun shines, all says the same thing, get at it. We're limited in time. It does not matter if it's only one person that you reach, that person was worth all the little insignificant effort that you seem to describe yourself as having. If you reached one soul, you make a difference. Number two, you make a difference because you may be able to reach folks that other folks can't. I didn't say me. I said other folks, it would include me, can't. And I don't mean due to time constraints. I can't be everywhere. Well, that's true. But you could be there and I could be here, and that's two as opposed to one place, right? I'm not talking about time constraints now. That was the previous point. But let's, let's use the preacher as an example here just for a second of what I'm trying to talk about. I'm a preacher, and that turns some people off. And I don't mean they hate my guts and I don't want to play golf with you. It means, though, that I don't want to talk religion with you. You intimidate them. That may be one. Uh, you know so much and I know so little, I'm embarrassed to even say that I don't know who Moses is and where Genesis is in the Bible. And can I give you some more examples? Um, whatever. That's all I got. Coming from me is different than coming from you. And I'm assuming you're not a full-time gospel preacher. They call them pastors and all that kind of thing. If you're not that, coming from you is different because, you are you know, we just work at the same place and you don't know any more than I do. <laughs> and you may know a lot more than they do, but they don't think you do because you're not a preacher. So you make a difference because you can reach people in ways that a preacher can't. Preachers are sometimes politely entertained without serious consideration. But you're not a preacher, at least not in the sense that they see it. And they may give you a hearing. You see, you make a difference. You have heard it often said, we may, we may not pass off onto, onto the preacher the work of us all. So true. It's his job full time, but not fully his job. I had to read that because I didn't want to mess it up. It's my job, Craig's job, those who are full-time evangelists, we have full-time jobs, but it's not fully our job. And other people need to be. You make a difference. Thank you very much. I've got a couple more and I'm through. I'm on the last page. <coughs> you make a difference because some approaches work differently with people, work better than, than with others. The approach used by one might not fit as well as with another. For instance, some folks respond better to hard-hitting sermons, strong presentations. I won't say any more about it. While others might be turned off, though, by that approach, I don't like being hammered. I had sermons last year called Hammer Time Sermon. I'd started off by saying, it's hammer time. And boy, they couldn't get that song out of there, <laughs> the whole rest of the sermon. But the Bible says, my word is a hammer, and so that's where I got it from. And I was hitting hard with some things. Some people like that. I got a lot of compliments, actually, and I wasn't trying to get compliments. But they love those hammer time sermons. But there are some folks that are drawn to a lower key, mild mannered, methodically laid out, conversational style approach. And those are very two, or two very uh, 
two extremes. There are other styles, too, that fit in somewhere or another. My point is this. Whatever style you may employ may be just the one to suit the someone that you're talking to, and you therefore make a difference. You make a difference because also your circle of acquaintances is not known to everybody, to all. You know people others don't. You probably know people others will not and or cannot ever know. Here we go. You ready? It may be coworkers. I'm sorry, they won't allow me to go in there and preach the gospel to your coworkers, at least not on the job in there. But you know them. You and you alone have inside access to them. Or it could be family members, schoolmates, or someone you know casually, like a teller at a bank, or a checkout lady at uh, your favorite grocery store, or whomever. You have connections that make you important to this. You most certainly do then make a difference. In conclusion, if you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus, you can say he died for all, if you cannot rouse the wicked with the judgment's dread alarms, you can lead the little children to the Savior's waiting arms. Let none hear you idly say, there's nothing I can do. While the souls of men are dying and the master calls to you, take the task he gives you gladly. Let his work your pleasure be. Answer quickly when he calls you. Here am I. Send me. Send me. That's the lesson. Thanks, Greg.